Divine Truth Paget Messages Discussions of Individual Messages Received by James Paget Jesus and Mary discuss some of the errors and deficiencies of Christian science, emotions, affections, desires, sin, and the mortal mind. The mind is not the originator of desires, appetites, and emotions. The message was received from Jesus on the 9th of July, 1916. This discussion was recorded on the 15th of June, 2013, in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Myself and Mary are together again to discuss one of the pageant messages this time. And uh, one of the reasons why we've selected this message is because it's uh, a message that I feel a lot of people have ignored from the pageant messages. Um, if my, a lot of times myself and Mary get comments, don't we, that the pageant messages don't contain anything about emotions and emotional matters. And this message, uh, as you, you will see, contains a lot about emotions and emotional matters. Of course, when we spoke to James Paget, we realised that being a lawyer, he, would also, he was quite detuned from his emotions in many ways. And it was only really after his wife's passing that he really opened up emotionally to, to some degree. And, and, that, and that degree allowed us to do a lot of channelling with him. But uh, we gave him many messages about his emotional condition, but unfortunately most of those messages were either lost or he never wrote them down or they were never copied because they were deemed to be his personal messages for his personal use only. And as a result, they never found themselves into the pageant messages. However, this message is one of those messages that we started talking about the emotional issues regarding humankind. And we wanted to have many of these messages transmitted to him, but unfortunately, he was quite resistive to such messages. So as you can see through this message. But this message was from the 9th of July, 1916. And the title of it that we've written down is Some of the Errors and Deficiencies of Christian Science, Emotions, Affections, Desires, Sin and the Mortal Mind. The mind is not the originator of desires, appetites and emotions. That's the primary theme of this particular message. And the message was from myself. So I feel very qualified to actually engage you in this discussion. <laughs> but Mary wanted to first uh, just talk about a little bit about some of the history just a little bit of the history of Christian science. Okay, so here's a bit of information and background on Christian science as it exists on earth. Mm. All right, Christian science is a set of beliefs and practices belonging to the metaphysical new thought family of new religious movements. It was developed in the 19th century in the United States by someone called Mary Baker Eddy. And Mary Baker, Mary Baker Eddy actually appears at other points in the Paget messages as well. She comes to speak to Paget directly mm. uh, later. Um, uh, in 1936, a census um, in the United States counted 270,000 Christian scientists in the United States. Um, but today, this is according to Wikipedia, the current worldwide membership est estimates about well, between 100,000 to 400,000 adherents. But as we know, Wikipedia is not always accurate. Not always that's accurate. Certainly not accurate with regard <laughs> yes. to what they say about us. But just a little, <laughs> exactly, just a little bit about the belief systems. Um, Christian scientists subscribe to the belief that spiritual reality is the only reality, and that the material world is an illusion. Hmm. This includes the view that sickness and death are illusions caused by mistaken beliefs and that the sick should be treated by a special form of prayer intended to correct those beliefs rather than by medicine. Hmm. And this is relevant because um, Jesus is about to start talking to Paget about some of these things in the message. Hmm. Yeah, so it's good to know a little bit of the background for most people because, because uh, otherwise they won't know what I'm referring to in exactly. the message so much. Yeah. So, but uh, let's get started with the message. I'll read the two, first two or three paragraphs and then we'll start discussing some of the things in them. The message starts, I am here, Jesus. I come today to tell you that I am pleased with you in your efforts to find the truth of what we have taught as to God and of the relation of man to him. I have been with you in your reading of several days past and have observed the effect upon you of the contrast between the beliefs and teachings of men, as you have read them, 
and the teachings of truth that we have revealed to you in our messengers. While these writings that you have been reading have in them some things of truth, yet there are many things that are wholly untrue and the mere results of speculation. And I, I suppose the very first comment I'd like to make about that is that we still see this really happening today, this, mm -hmm. this mixture of truth with untruth that occurs in so many religious thoughts. So there's always been some kind of inspiration from the spirit world uh, put upon the person who's created a spe specific religion. But in the end, there's usually a mixture of truth with untruth. And the problem with that is that quite often then people think they're hearing the same thing when they hear something of the same terminology, when actually it is very, very different. So what, one of the things that I feel is a main problem, and I'm just, sorry, I'm just going to have to stop. <laughs> we, we just nearly had burnt the house down, that's all. And so now we've got to start again. No, it's not quite that bad. <laughs> the light behind us started smoking. So uh, let's go back to what I, what I mentioned there. So So... With regard to the writings that we're reading, some being true, some being not true, and this, we sort of see this as a big problem on the planet because the problem is, is when you hear something that sounds similar to something else, the, the way in which most people emotionally respond to that is that they then assume that because they're hearing the words that sound similar, that it means that the whole teachings are similar. And that's not the case at all. So it's very interesting when we get emails, because quite often we get emails from religious people who say, oh, you're just teaching New Age teachings. And that's not the case at all. And then we get pe emails from New Age <laughs> people who say, you're just teaching Christian teachings, and that's not true at all. <laughs> and we get this constant uh, accusation from one party that we're teaching something from the other because they hear the words and because those words are associated with other types of teachings that, that are a mixture of false and true, they then assume and place divine truth teachings in amongst the, in, in, in the same boat. It's, it's one of the huge limitations of language itself, isn't it? Yeah. When, when there's no sensitivity to feeling mm. and we're just relying on <coughs> language, it can easily become very confusing, can't it? Yes, and we also find, don't we, that many of the people who think they understand what we've been teaching, some think that we know, have known them for five years and they think that they understand what we're teaching and we know completely that they have no understanding at all what we're teaching at this point. Mm -hmm. And you just sent off an email today to one man who um, you know, thinks and, and, and has thought for some time that he knows exactly what we've been teaching without having really any personal understanding about it. And that's the problem that uh, we see with a lot of teachings in the sense that when you hear the words, you then assume these words are associated with, with things that are not true. And, and this is one of the points I was trying to make here uh, to Paget that, that quite often there is a mixture of truth and untruth. And the problem is, is when we bind all the truth and untruth together into a certain teaching, we then sort of almost blacken the truth with mm -hmm. the things that are not true. And I see that as a main, pro a, a very big problem on the planet today. So, yeah, there's another message that perhaps we'll discuss another time that I think John gave to Paget about how to determine what is true and what is not. And mm. I feel that that's a beautiful um, piece as well about how we can begin to differentiate the truth from the error and what we're mm. what we're encountering. Yes. Yeah. So let me re read the rest as we go. Today, if you feel in condition. I will instruct you as to some of the errors and deficiencies of Christian science and the want of the true comprehension of its founder of the realities of being. Now, this is something I too feel that I need to mention to people is that I see divine truth or God's absolute truth as the reality of being. Everything else is really the, a man-made or humankind construction of the, their own reality of being and not the reality of being, God's reality. And what we have here on the earth is not God's reality. And in fact, many times we judge what's happening on earth and even judge God based on what's happening on earth when what's happening on earth is actually the construction of man's reality, which is actually in disharmony with the laws of God and therefore not a part of God's reality. And in this regard, man has become, or humankind has become, the creator of their own reality. Now, that doesn't mean that the things that they create are not real, mm. because they are real. 
there are definite things about, that are a part of this reality. For example, pain and suffering is real. It's not a, a figment of our imagination. It's not just something that, that, that you know, we imagine happens. It is actually occurring. But it, it is occurring because of our constructions, because of our creations, and not because of any other thing. And this was something that I wanted to get across to Paget in this message, this importance, the importance of understanding how much of humankind's reality at present on this planet is totally governed by humankind's creation, which are in direct opposition to God's laws and therefore bear the consequences of the opposition of God's laws. And this was one of the things we were trying to, I was trying to illustrate to Paget throughout this message. So, and really there you just said two things, didn't you? You said that mankind is often creating his own collective reality um, through the use of our will. But just because God didn't create it doesn't make it any less real. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So God creates things that are real. Exactly. We also create things that are real. Exactly. And that's really the workings of free will, isn't it? That is correct. Yeah. And, that, and the importance of our, the use of our will, which is something that we want to get across to people quite Absolutely. strongly, is something that we'll discuss in other messages. But uh, the importance of using our will in harmony with love in comparison to what happens in, in terms of the negative consequences of what happens when we use our will out of harmony with love it, we are creating two separate realities and in fact you can be living in the same house and be creating two separate realities in fact yep. Yeah, yep. which is an interesting concept yes. okay so I've, I've said about the writer of Christian science she writes and teaches that there is nothing real in sin and error and disease and that their apparent existence is wholly due to the mortal mind and that when this mind denies the existence of these things, they will no longer exist. Well, in this assertion, there is a large grain of truth, but in order to understand and apply this truth, more than a mere denial of their existence must be taught and believed by man. So here I'm basically introducing the thought to Paget that like, while it is true that our intellectual belief systems do have creations of their own, we cannot just assume that the denial of those belief systems will cause the creations to disappear. And there is good reason for that. And, this is, and the good reasons are all about the soul and how the soul works in comparison to how the mind works. And this is where I was leading to in the message. Yeah, and um, I suppose that I feel a little bit familiar with this kind of reasoning, this or this... I think in Wikipedia they referred to Christian science as um, belonging to the metaphysical New Thought family mm -hmm. of new religious movements. Mm. And um, before I remembered who I was and growing up in my family, I had you know various contacts with people you know in in my social sphere that I believe probably belonged to this you know New Thought movement or mm. New Age perhaps. Mm. And I always had this struggle when people would say, it's just an illusion, Mary. It's not real. Yeah, so Suffering many of them say that, don't they? <laughs> and I, I, unbeknownst to me, I suppose it was the truth already in my soul, but I would have this screaming internal thing of like, <laughs> hang on, something's not right here. Yeah. It feels real. And, and this is the, as you said, the dominance of the soul mm. really over our experience. Yeah, I remember one conversation you had with a friend on, over the phone where she was trying to say to you that it was all an illusion and nothing was real. And, and, and basically, we're all a part of God. And we're and all part of God and everything. Yeah. And, and these concepts, while they might sound all nice, the reality is they, they don't have any existence in God's reality. They do have an existence in ours because we've created the thought and then we live by that thought, yeah. which creates then its own existence of some kind. But if you examine the lives of these people, and it was interesting with the woman that talked to you on the phone, I can remember that, that her life was that her and her husband hadn't lived together. They lived together, but they hadn't actually lived together for 20 years. So, that they had this, so she's got this terrible marriage, but in her mind, it's all an illusion. And, and that just demonstrates the, the lack of, uh, well, well the, the amount of denial of the reality. Mm -hmm. that she is actually using her mind 
to deny. And this is what I was getting at in this message is that, sure, humankind can use their mind to deny the reality, but it doesn't change the fact that the reality <laughs> that exists. exists. <laughs> yeah. And for me, I, you know, living in different places and always feeling very attuned to the suffering that is actually occurring on our planet right now, mm. encountering these people and talking about my experiences and them I would encounter them denying the reality of other people, denying yeah. the suffering of other people in order to distance themselves from from, from reality. reality. Yeah, we and see that all the time, don't yeah. we, with like people that we know in the third world and other countries. That, And when we start sharing with people who in the Western world, the reality of their existence is like a total detourment from, from the cause because most of the cause of this reality for the third world is in fact the Western world and its, and its ability to, to rape the resources of mm -hmm. the third world. So, you know, again, we create a certain reality and then we deny its existence. And, and I feel it's a very dangerous thing we do because when we deny the existence of our own creations, we are not any longer sensitive to the feedback mechanism that God has provided in order for us to correct our unloving behaviour. Mm -hmm. So when we deny that we are a part of something that's created in the world, what we're actually doing is denying the feedback mechanism that God can use to correct us. And, and, and for that reason, it's a very dangerous thing to do, to deny yeah, reality. I totally agree. Like mm. the feelings that we have surround, you know, the, the compassion or the, the common pain we have with people who are suffering, mm. that's part of God saying, yes, there is something wrong. There yeah. is something wrong. And when we say, oh, it's all an illusion, we're all part of God, everyone's in perfect love already, mm. that's a way of really, as you said, denying, denying what God's already trying to show us is yeah. out of harmony. And I feel a lot of people we know are still doing this with regard to the law of attraction. Yeah. The law of attraction is bringing certain events into their life and we see them constantly pointing the finger at other people, you know, not reflecting upon, no, this is their reality, so something must be inside of themselves that is out of harmony with God's laws and principles, not in other people that are causing this reality to be. Yeah. And, and we see so many people still denying their, the, their own creations, which, which the law of attraction is bringing back to them reflecting to them this is your creation mm -hmm. and and the importance of seeing your own creation rather than denying it is so important for your future development in terms of your future happiness but your future life with God but also your future happiness and meeting your soulmate and all the other things that can occur in your life that are all beautiful while you deny your own reality none of these things can occur and I was just reflecting upon the letter that you got today from this man, how much in denial of his own reality and his own creations he is, and yet he still, uh, still arrogantly, in fact, assumes that he knows the divine truth when it's evident through, through his own creations that he has no knowledge whatsoever no. of the principles. And just using words in order to carry on with being very unkind to others, yes. using words of divine truth. truth. In order to be unloving. In order to be very un cruel, really. Yeah, yeah, and unloving to others. Yeah. So if I continue reading um, this, it is true that God never created anything of evil or that which is not in harmony with his nature and essence, which are only good, and that to ascribe the existence of these evils and discords to God is erroneous and blasphemous. But the fact remains that these things exist and the mere denial of their existence does not remedy the harmful results that flow from such existence. So I feel this is a very important paragraph that I've tried to get across to Badgett, <laughs> is that we cannot ever ascribe anything negative to God. God never created it. So we must understand that not everything in this universe was created by God. This is the gift God gave us. By giving us the gift of free will, God gave us the gift of creating things that are actually of our own creation and have nothing to do with God. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and all of the evils, in fact, that mankind suffer um, are the creations of humankind. I did an interview last night or the night before with a guy in Iceland. Yeah. And, um, it was a great interview. Yeah. And I think we'll probably, by the time this is on, it will also be on the net. But uh, he asked me, one of his reasons why he felt that God could not exist was because he felt that, that, you know, why is there all this pain and suffering on earth? 
well, the pain and suffering on earth is the direct result of this mm -hmm. issue. The denial of our own feedback system that we have created, we create certain creations and then we deny what these creations affect. We deny it. We, we make out that, it, and, and we even go so far as to blame God for our own creations. Right? Yes. And th this is something that is way out of harmony with taking any self responsibility. Yeah, and just um, to clarify, using we really like collectively Collective humankind. as humankind. Yeah. Because obviously, um, I am not involved in murder right now. Uh, However, uh, yeah, we've got to be careful even there, yes, don't we? This, this like, is what I want to what say. are some of the things that we do in our day-to-day -day life that do that can only be supported by murder? And, and I've often given people this example of a, a diamond ring on your finger, and a lot of people have died to mine diamonds. Yes, and and we've got to start asking ourselves, okay, it's something that we don't even need. And it's only something that, that meets our addiction to think that we're loved or be beautiful. So it's not even essential for our life and, yes. or essential for our happiness to wear a wing on our finger. And yet, and yet we're willing to see people murdered in order for, for it to occur. And this is a problem that we have. Yeah, and I suppose that's what I kind of wanted to raise was this idea that I, I also have a large problem with people saying... Um, well, we're all wonderful or we're all evil or we're, you know, these blanket statements mm -hmm. because I feel that's very distancing from, no, I have a soul that's unique and it's sensitive mm -hmm. and there are certain emotions within me that are signalling error that's within my soul. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to be specific about what that is mm -hmm. emotionally, like specific, not with my intellect only but just with my feelings. Yes. Um, but... Something that I often think about in discussions that we had early on when, when I re-met you <laughs> was about this idea that if, um, if I have pain, if I have anger, if I have fear within me, um, well, they are essentially things that are... God doesn't feel those things, mm. so they're errors within me. Mm. And while there are errors within me in any situation, if I'm in a situation where, say, in the situation with this email that I had this morning from this fellow who was saying that, you know, the main problem was that the person he was interacting with was very arrogant and very condescending and he needed to just stand up for truth. Mm. But his entire emotional condition was angry, um, wishing to have power over someone. Mm -hmm. And so he wasn't being sensitive to the fact that his own emotions were signalling he has error within him that mm. is a part of what is creating something really negative on the planet right now. Exactly. Um, so I suppose that's my long-winded way of saying, you know, I feel that we need to be very careful of blanket statements in either, in either direction of saying, well, we all created it. We'll know what is the specific thing inside of me that does support these, these creations. Yeah. 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 No, it's very important for us to, to be self-analytical yeah. with regard to everything that occurs in our day-to-day -day life and whatever we attract. Yeah. And, and this is where I feel most people are resistive. Yeah. Certainly. Okay, so the fact remains, as I said, that these things exist and the mere denial of their existence does not remedy the harmful results that flow from such existence. Mm. And I, I see this is also what people are doing frequently and that is that they try to deny constantly the existence of certain things within themselves and then they say, oh, I've got no idea why I can't really connect to God or I've got no idea why I can't really have a good relationship with my partner. I don't no idea why that person got angry with me and why, this per why, why I felt angry with this person. And, and the reality is all of those things have to be occurring because you're denying the existence of something within yourself. Yes. That, that, that can be the only reason why they're occurring because none of these things could occur in your reality if your reality was God's reality. That's, a, that's the, a true statement. So it's very important for us to stop denial. Mm. And I've given many talks in the early days about denial, and, I, and yet I still feel that the majority of people we talk to are still in denial. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what we can do about that, but, but it is a self and analytical thing. It's something that you've got to want to get out of yourself. And, and you also need to stop denying whether you even have a relationship with God or not. Like yeah. That's the primary denial I feel that most people are in. They say, oh, yes, I've been praying to God for five years. Have you, have you felt anything back? Well, not really. 
And whose fault's that, do you think? You know, well, what do you mean, whose fault's that? You know, well, is it God's or yours <laughs> that you haven't felt anything back, you know? And, oh, well, you know, they don't want to feel that it's theirs. Yeah. And so they deny even that it's theirs. And they assume that there must be something that God, they're not getting about God, um, you know, that, that, that is causing God to not give them the love they're asking for. And the reality is that God would be giving them love if they were actually asking for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's got to be something wrong going on inside of themselves. And people are so worried and angry about things going on inside themselves. We got an email from a chappie the other day who was swearing and abusive in this email to us because somebody, someone had dared to tell him that his own sickness was caused by something he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is how the level of denial is on this planet. It is yeah. so strong that we don't even want to see our own creations. Yeah. 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 Yep. And in a way, Christian science is saying, okay, let's see it as our own creation. So this is very good. And this is what I was saying to Paget is that one good thing about the Christian science belief systems is it does tell you that you are the creator of these things that are out of harmony with love that happen to you. Yes. So that, that's a very good thing. So there's a lot of, a large grain of truth, as I said, in that. But, uh, but there are also a lot of problems with, with thinking that it's all to do with the mind, which is what I go on to explain. Yeah. Okay. So because it's my message, I'll read the lot, if that's all right with you, babe. That's fine. Man suffers from evil and error and disease and has always so suffered since the fall from his state of perfection and always will suffer in consequence of their being in his consciousness these things of reality. And the mere calling them the result of the mortal mind will not explain their existence or furnish a remedy by which they may be gotten rid of. <laughs> so here I'm focused on, okay, let's, what I'm basically saying now is, look, we have all of these things that are really happening on the planet. We have all of these things that are really happening to you, really happening to me. They're not figments of our imagination, as people you know, in New Age circles may have us believe. They are really happening. We have to stop denying that they're really happening. But we have to also see that what is the underlying reason for their creation. We, no, we need to understand, understand the cause, mm -hmm. see, rather than just looking at the effects. Or, and, and we're basically going through steps here. We're going denial of the effect, seeing the effect, and then understanding the cause. So many people on the planet at the moment are here in complete denial of the effect even. Mm -hmm. Once we go into some, uh, some development with regard to our own desire to connect to God and our own desire to be real, we get into starting to see the truth that these things have been affected, that we actually are real about the effects. We mm -hmm. say, well, there, there we go. There's another effect of something that has happened or has, has happened or has been done that is the result of acting out of harmony with love. We might not know that, but we at least can see the effect. We can say, there's another effect. See that unhappiness there, that's another effect. And that suffering there, that's another effect. Then the next level of awareness is understanding there's a cause to every effect. Mm. And this is where I feel the majority of people on the planet are in complete unawareness because we're not seeing the true cause. And what I'm trying to illustrate the pageant here is there is a true cause of everything, a true cause of everything. And if you remove the cause, the effect will disappear. Yep. Sorry, I'm doing a lot of talking, darling, but okay. <laughs> after You're on all, a roll. I'm on a roll. <laughs> First arises the necessity of understanding how and by what means these things came into existence. And then it will become easier for the understanding of the means and the way by which they may be eliminated from the life and apparent nature of mankind. And this is talking about the causes that you're just referring to. Exactly. Yeah. So what we're here saying is we need to find the cause of how they came into effect. Once we find the cause, we now have the ammunition, if you like, to, or, or some way of looking at the cause and dealing with the cause and, and working our way through the cause. So once the cause is eliminated, then the effect will naturally be eliminated. Now, that is a very logical statement. I am full of logical statements, right? <laughs> and I find that uh, people who have a lot of religious beliefs on the planet often are very illogical. You know, they, they want to believe all sorts of things 
that are completely illogical, but, but everything to do with God's truth is logical. We need to point mm. that out, I feel. As I have already told you, these things, foreign to God's creation, were created by man alone in the excessive and unlawful exercise of his willpower in following out the suggestions and desires of his animal appetites, which unduly asserted themselves when man lost a part of his spirituality by his disobedience. So let's talk about this paragraph. Hey? It's a very important paragraph. <laughs> yes. um, you say, as I've already told you, these things foreign to God's creation were created by man alone in the excessive and unlawful exercise of his willpower. Mm -hmm. um, I love that you use the word unlawful mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's really referring to the fact that we're we're using our will in disharmony with God's laws. Mm. That's what you really mean by that statement, isn't it? Exactly. And so, uh, yeah, and so that's actually where we're satisfying what you call the animal appetites. So, Yes, and I'm not here saying that the animal appetites are actually unlawful. What I am saying is if we excessively use them out of harmony with law, then they become unlawful. So, for example, a lot of people assume from a statement like that that, say, the sexual appetite that a person may have is unlawful. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the unlawful use of sexual appetite is possible. And, in fact, the majority of people on the planet continue to have the unlawful use. And it's not the unlawful use from man mankind's perspective. In other words, it's not having sex when you're out of harmony, in, not in a marriage. Yeah. It's nothing to do with that. It's to do the unlawful exercise from what God's laws are, not what human laws are. And we need to see it as that, as every time we act out of harmony with God's laws, that is what causes these pain and suffering of our own creation. They are not of God's creation. As I say here, they are foreign to God's creation. God hasn't created any pain and suffering mm -hmm. at all. And in fact, if all of us engaged all of God's laws, there would be no pain and suffering, literally. So, so we need to understand that pain and suffering has come about through the unlawful exercise of our willpower, the way in which we exercise our will. And I'm also saying here that when we start to exercise our will in an unlawful manner, the, uh, the underlying appetites or addictions, you could call them, rise within us and they finish up dominating any sense of our spiritual nature. Mm -hmm. They finish up dominating us even in terms of whether we're loving or not. So this is where we see a lot of people, they go, once you start exercising your un unlawful, uh, your, your appetites in an unlawful manner, you then have certain addictions that are created, which have as a, ha as a driving force behind them a desire to have more unlawful exercise. And then more and then more. And as the unlawful exercise increases, so too does the pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. And we need to see this relationship. And, and, uh, and eventually they increase so much that we can't even get back, or it's very, very difficult to get back, our true spiritual nature, our true nature, the way God intended our soul to be. And... And this is, I feel, something that most people are not aware of either, is that sometimes they say, oh, it just feels like... And this is where a lot of these uh, Christian beliefs and other similar beliefs come, that man is just bad all the time, you know. And there's a scripture in the Bible that actually says the heart of man is evil from the time he was born onwards. <laughs> and, and they don't understand why that's the case. And the reason why is because we've had such a long stream of unlawful exercise of our appetites that in the end, those appetites or addictions have become so strong that they dominate our nature. Yeah. And therefore, it seems like we're evil or created evil. Yeah, I see. So, but in this paragraph here, um, it says, following out the suggestions and desires of his animal appetites, which unduly asserted themselves when man lost a part of his spirituality by his disobedience. Now, when I first read that, I felt that that was um, referring to the choices of Ammon and a man. Uh, it seems to be well, a very biblical it is. sort of a reference. Yeah. yeah, it is referring to the choices of Ammon and a man. But, but, of course, each one of us individually are making the same choices. So yes. if we look at Ammon and a man's original choices, 
their, their choices were to act out of harmony with law, and in particular, out of harmony with the law of love. Mm -hmm. Now, we could, even being their progeny, we could act in harmony. But, but unfortunately, because the animal appetites have become so dominant, we don't think about that. Yes. We don't think it's possible to act in harmony and therefore remove all the causes. And also when I, say there, when I said there they, that he lost a part of his spirituality, that is also true. It's like the way God created this is that our soul should dominate the two bodies, the mm -hmm. physical and spiritual bodies. So the physical relating to the physical universe, the spirit body relating to the spirit universe and having all of the sensory apparatus reflecting upon the spirit universe and the soul, which is the real us. If it was driven by love, would control both bodies. But what's happened in terms of man allowing these appetites of both the spirit and material bodies to start to assert themselves to the point where the soul has lost its control to a large degree over what they do in terms of a positive direction. Mm. So, and because of a lot of these appetites have now entered the soul, the soul now has darkened in its condition and now the, we, the soul allows the appetites of the bodies to assert themselves to such a degree that we're willing to break the law in order for them to be fulfilled. Mm. And that's what we see happening still for many people who, are not, who want to progress towards God but are still not understanding the importance of acting in harmony with the love they receive. Yeah, and that's something we want to talk a lot more about, isn't it? Yeah. But perhaps just to give a brief example of these appetites, because we're talking in these this very emotive language about yeah, yeah. appetites and darkness and yeah. spirituality. We're not just talking about chocolate cake, are we? No. No. So, Although that can lead you to some very terrible things. Well, yes. <laughs> well, it can, you know. And the feeling that a lot of us have that we need a drink or we need something, you know, like comfort food. Smoking, you know, uh, alcohol, drugs, many of these, uh, what we, we would call appetites that lead to harmful things to our body, are all, they're all addictions that have asserted themselves because the soul itself is not dominant. Yes. Mm. And the feeling of wishing to avoid the soul's pain mm -hmm. is dominating us. So exactly. So give me a distraction. Give me a quick fix. Give me a, a something to help me avoid. Give me a tune out. Give me something to run away. Yes. Mm. And this is the type of things that we're talking about, isn't it? Where yeah. the, the, the appetites, these animal appetites, as they're referred to in the, your message, yeah. are actually dominating. But it can be things that are not physical in nature, can't it? The desire for power, the desire for control is a huge one that I see yeah. everywhere, especially in the West. We're so addicted to being able to be in control of our day-to-day -day life. When we get up, when things happen, what we eat, where mm -hmm. we go, how we go there, we're, we're actually constructed an entire society where control is almost one of our highest priorities mm. and, and and that's fear driven of course yes it's about the fear of what's going to happen to me if i'm not in control of this situation what am mm. i going to feel if i'm not in control of this situation? so you could say one of the animal appetites is fear even fear yes. it creates a lot of negative things on this planet as you know in fact i feel it's one of the greatest enemies of love yes. and uh, and and we're constantly basing most of our choice and decisions in this planet on fear. Yes. Mm. And then we lose the satisfaction, the ultimate spiritual satisfaction that comes when we confront our fear and actually experience joy or mm. experience love or mm. experience God. These are all more spiritual parts of our nature, aren't they? Yes. That are being drowned out by these animal appetites. Exactly. Yeah. So we need to see these animal appetites. It's not just the physical things that we want to experience, you know, the physical the physical things that we're trying to experience, but, but rather we also need to see them as all of the emotions, the emotions that we want to experience. So, so the average person who's afraid, for example, doesn't want fear. Mm -hmm. so, and, and so that desire to not feel their fear will assert itself, eventually gets to a, such a big thing that we're willing to deny love, we're willing to deny truth, we're willing to deny all sorts of things that are all part of our good nature mm -hmm. in order to have the denial of fear satisfied. In other words, fear now has become our God. Yes. And God's not our God and even love is not our God. Now fear is our God. 
And, and as soon as anything asserts itself to the point where our soul is subjected to it, it becomes our God, whatever it is. So for a lot of people on the planet, alcohol is their God or, or drugs are their God or, or sex is their God or, and, and power is their God, control is their God, fear is their God mm -hmm. and so forth. You could list all the different gods of mankind and most of them are not idols <laughs> but rather <laughs> emotions that yes. they're trying to avoid. And this is something that I was trying to get across to Paget in this message as we'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's, this is how it's created, isn't it? This yeah. is how all this evil is created. Yes. Yeah. So their creation, now we're talking about these things foreign to God's creation, so anything evil or that is created by the exercise or the unlawful exercise of man's will, their creation was a relative of something more than what the founder of that science calls the mortal mind. For the mind is only a part of man's being. And while the faculties of the mind must be used in the operation of all the powers and qualities of man, yet the mind is not the originator of all his desires and appetites and emotions. The emotional nature and affections are distinct from the mere mind or the intellectual faculties. And as regards sin and error, are generally the creators of the same although the mind may and does foster and increase these things so created. Now, this is such an important paragraph. I'd like to read part of it again. It says basically that the emotional nature and affections are distinct from the mere mind and are the creators of sin and error. So, we're not, so I'm not saying here that the mind is the creator of sin and error. I'm saying the emotions and appetites and desires that are out of harmony with love, out of harmony with law, are the creators of sin and error. Mm -hmm. And this is something I've been trying to get across to people for years and years and years, right? And, and I find it so interesting that even people who are what I would classify as Paget affectionados, <laughs> yes. people who have read the Paget messages uh, very regularly, they do not understand the importance of, of grasping this concept. Mm -hmm. Because this concept is, is very clearly stating that the emotional and affectation nature, affection nature of the soul, which is not a part of the mind, is the actual creator of sin and error. And so if, if it is the creator, it therefore makes sense that the only way to remove sin and error is to remove the things that create it in the emotions and affections, yes. not use your mind to do something different. Yes, yeah. which is why you, why you say to Paget earlier, it's the necessity. First, we have to understand how and by what means these things came into existence. So you're saying, yep. look, these Christian scientists, they're all saying it's all a part of their mind. They've just got to change their mind and these things won't exist. But the problem is they don't understand the causes. Well, it, yeah, and, and the, the proof is that that isn't true. Many Christian scientists have died yes. as a result of their, of their sicknesses because their mind, and they often say their mind wasn't powerful enough to cure it. No, mm -hmm. it's because the, the, the creation of that problem was coming from their soul, not their mind. Yes, yes. And denial of it doesn't make it go away. No, but even then they just say, well, death isn't real anyway. And so it's just a whole uh, Another level of denial. kind of level of denial. Exactly. Yeah. Um, whereas I love that the truth is, no, our experience means something. It's here to teach us something. Yeah. And what happens is a great way to know ourselves and ultimately to know God. Yeah. And so and what I was getting at, though, is you were saying, no, you have to understand the causes. And here you tell us the causes. Exactly. Which is, it's not about the mind. It's about these emotional parts of ourselves that yeah. create the problems. But I'm not saying that the mind isn't a part of the re remedy because the mind is, as I've pointed out in this paragraph, it's very, very important for people to understand the proper use of their mind because the mind can be used to either support the negative direction that a person has taken or to actually try to help them take a positive direction. Mm -hmm. The mind is a very powerful tool that we have if it's logically used to assist us in, in certain directions, one way or the other. And this is why it is so important for us to understand that the mind is a part, or, and, and certainly a part that needs to be honoured with regard to sorting through these particular issues, but it is not the creator. Mm. It, it's not the thing that created these particular desires foreign to God's creation. Yeah. 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 
Okay, so I, I said here, then man must understand that these excreances to his perfect creation are real and existing and result in his own damnation and alienation from the good and are antagonistic to his original and natural condition of perfection. And they, they cannot be swept out of existence by the mere assertion that they are not real. Mm. Now, in some of the uh, talks I've given in this century, I've talked about you know sweeping our rubbish under the carpet <laughs> and then everybody walks around it saying there's no rubbish anymore when <laughs> yes. it's all just hidden under the carpet. Or, or I've used another extent, uh, illustration of putting all of our, our Excrement, excrement in a pile in the middle of the room and everyone walks around saying nothing stinks. <laughs> and, and that's generally what we do with a lot of our, um, with a lot of our uh, creations. We, we, we sweep them on the carpet and say, oh, you know, we didn't do that. <laughs> we didn't do that. Nobody owns up to that. And, and in fact, everybody uh, has a tendency even then to say that it's not even a problem, that yes. it doesn't stink. Yes. And, and we need to come to terms with the fact that these creations that we have created, both individually for our own personal life, but also collectively, which affect all of humankind on earth, they are creations that we can't sleep under the carpet and they are real. We just got to look around us and, and we see all the reality of them. Yes, and, and that they are antagonistic to original and natural condition, to our original and natural condition. Yes. And yeah, that if everything was so rosy, everything would be rosy. Would be rosy. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't be after using our mind to kind of. To, to try and deny, deny what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Yes. And I said again, man must understand that they are the creatures primarily of the inordinate exercise of the animal appetites and desires and not of the exercise of the mind. And that they are to be eradicated by the same process in reverse order as to what was used in their creation. Now, of course, that makes a lot of logical sense. It does. Uh, but we often don't understand that. We, we, we start sort of, if we are not in complete denial of what we've created, we, we basically say, oh, I don't know why these things are created. Oh, oh, that bad thing happened today to me, but I don't know why. You know, and that is also myself just being in complete denial of what's inside of my, my soul personally. And it's not in my mind that's going to change it because it's not my mind that created it. Mm -hmm. Now, my mind can help me change it by helping me access the emotions and appetites and desires that are inside of my soul that cause this creation. But, but, and, and certainly if my mind's in complete denial of that, it's not going to help it. But, but the reality is I can exercise my mind for the next thousand years and I'm still not going to eradicate the problem yes. unless I start addressing the emotion. And, and look, I love this par these few paragraphs really say a lot about dealing with causal emotion. You know, um, here you've said that, you know, this ordinate, inordinate exercise of these animal appetites and desires, which we were talking about earlier, these using these desires to get away from the pain that's really in our soul, mm. that creates badness. Mm. But the only way to reverse it is to do the same, do exercise our appetites and desires in reverse order, mm -hmm. which is to stop, you know, wanting, stop using our will and our emotion and our force to avoid pain mm -hmm. and, and suppress pain, mm -hmm. uh, recognising that the suppression creates evil, mm -hmm. ah, we'll have to unsuppress, we'll have to allow, we'll have to express exactly. these darker things in order for them to, to heal and yeah. make room for goodness. Yeah. So it's all there in this message. Exactly. Yeah. And one thing I find quite interesting about this message and many people who criticise our teachings, right, is that, is that the very criticism of it, the emotionality of the teachings of divine truth aids the person to continue suppression, mm -hmm. which actually aids the individual to continue the creation of all the pain and suffering that occurs. So, so and, you can, and in a way, you can see the spirits behind this. Every time a person goes into some kind of emotional experience that is actually a true emotional experience, I'm not talking about ones that are fabricated or ones that are imagined, but ones that are real, you often find that the person gets criticised or denigrated by family, friends, media, all sorts of people, and spirits as well mm -hmm. around them. And that's because the spirits around them know that while these emotions remain in them, the spirits have got control. 
and the people around them, the family, friends, and everyone know that while these emotions remain in them, the family's got control. Mm -hmm. Once we release these particular emotions, you for the first time will be in control. Your soul will be for the first time in real control of what's going on. And, and I find this is one of the sad things that I find whenever, whenever emotion is criticised. And here I'm speaking again about emotion that is real, not fabricated or imagined or just a tantrum. I'm talking about true causal emotions that are the cause of our existence. The, when these emotions are criticised, what we're really doing is aiding the suppression of the soul and aiding the... The, 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 continuation. the continuation of pain and suffering. Yes. And, the, and that, that's very unfortunate. Yeah. And this is something I was trying to get across to Padgett as well, that we can't deny the existence of these emotions and appetites that are out of harmony with law and then at the same time hope that we're going to have uh, less pain and suffering in our lives. It's impossible. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You were going to say something, but No. Oh, just... Um Surrounding this idea of emotions, you mentioned a couple of times that you're speaking about real emotion. Yeah. Because um, it does, it, reversing these creations does require that we get real mm -hmm. about what our appetites and desires are yeah. out of harmony with love. And yeah. I see that a lot of people, again, we've mentioned a few times in this discussion about people misusing what we say to further their unloving appetites and desires. I agree. They're saying, oh, I need to be emotional. I've just got to express myself. Oh, and actually they're When not... really they're being very unloving when they're expressing themselves, which is actually using their appetites, appetites and, and emotions yes. in an unlawful way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which is going to harm them further. Yeah, it's actually not what we're teaching. We're teaching no. them something very different, the reversal of that process. And, but it, takes, it requires integrity to law yeah. and a sincerity to grow and a sincerity to love. Yes. Uh, yeah, so that's and a sincerity for truth as well, real yeah. truth, not just what we want to imagine ourselves to be or imagine what the problem is, but rather what the problem truly is from God's perspective. Yes, yeah. yeah. I agree. So, um, of course, uh, I'm down to there, aren't yeah. I? Of course, it must not be lost sight of that in using this process, the faculties of the mind must be brought into operation just as they were in the creation of these existences. In other words, I'm saying here, well, look, we used our mind to go along with our unlawful appetites, which eventually created our sin and error and pain and suffering. We're going to need to use our mind in completely the opposite direction if we're ever going to recover from this, but, but the mind is not the cause. Yes. Right? We, just need, we need to use our mind a certain way. And the great fact to remem be remembered in this process is that these things are real... Mm -hmm. and not the things of the mere imagination, which is the equivalent of the founders, Miss Mary Baker Eddy, mortal mind. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to understand that they are not just things that we are imagining. That's not the creation of disease. They are actual creations. They are physical creations and spiritual it's, creations. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Now, when man grasps the meaning, and thus explained, of what these things really are and how they came into being, then he will be the more readily then he will the more readily comprehend the way or means by which they are to be destroyed and never again permitted to become a part of his being. For while they do not by nature belong to his being, yet by reason of his being the creator of them, they are, so far as his consciousness is concerned, together with all the results flowing therefrom, a part of his being, and that part which keeps him in discord with the laws controlling his own existence. Now, that's quite a long sentence. I and, often and joke <laughs> that, yep, both centuries, we both like long sentences. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit of a problem we still have. But yeah. it's very hard to describe in, in any language on the planet what we're trying to mean, and this was a problem we had constantly in the pageant messages, of course, and this is why many of the <laughs> sentences became a bit long. But basically what I'm saying here, that it, we must understand that once we destroy and never any more allow to be a part of our being the things that we've currently created that cause our pain and suffering, mm -hmm. then, of course, all the pain and suffering will be removed. And we need to understand that we are the creator of them and we are 
and as a result, these things we have created are a part of our being while we're creating them. Yes. So, so even though God did not originally create us with the potent, you know, with the, um, you know, with pain and suffering, we need to understand that pain and suffering have become a part of us, not because God originally created them, mm-hmm. as many even Christian found, uh, families believe, yeah. but because we have created them themselves. And whenever we create something, they actually do become a physical part of our life. Mm-hmm. They are something that are completely reflected back into our life. They are, in fact, a part of our soul, even, because we've created them. Mm-hmm. They've become a part of our soul. And we need to remove them in the same manner to which we created them. And this is a you know, very, very important thing. But we need to understand that just because God created us perfect and, and beautiful without these errors, it doesn't mean that these errors are now not a part of our soul. Yeah. So I see a lot of new age people going, yeah, the reality is everyone has a beautiful soul. Everybody is perfect. Yeah. No, I can't agree. Yeah. God created the original perfect soul, but then we, through our own creations out of harmony with law, created a lot of imperfections in our soul. Mm-hmm. And this is something, and they are now a part of us. Yes. They are now a part of our being. I think in that phone call that you referred to that I was having with an old friend um, earlier, uh, she said to me, but Mary, even, even the murderer is, is God. We're all God. Uh, to which I said to her, no, I can't agree with that. And I don't think God's very murderous at all. <laughs> no, in fact, uh, God has no murderous tendencies no. whatsoever. <laughs> God loves the murderer, absolutely. Mm. And God has compassion and the murderer And God has... never created them to be a murderer. No, God didn't put murder into their personality or nature. No. But God has created a system for them to heal from, from that situation and to never carry those emotions ever again. Exactly. Now, see, to me, that's a far more meaningful and empowered yeah. um, reality than just saying, well, we're all God and bad shit happens, yeah. really. <laughs> and, I was just re- and I was just reflecting, too, how it's interesting how the new age person is almost identical to a Christian on this, in, yeah. in this regard to some degree, but often the flip side in, in a sense. It's like uh, like we've t- spoken to many Christians who basically believe that God makes people's hearts hard. Now, how, <laughs> how can a loving being make somebody's hearts hard? Yeah. God would never choose to do such yeah. a thing. And, and yet the Bible itself does say that, that yeah. the Bible uh, in some places has said that God chose to make a certain person's heart heart or God chose certain people and then has not chosen other people Mm -hmm. and these of course are false beliefs about God and and interestingly enough and the reason why I bring that up is because here what we're saying the Christian is saying God chose to make the heart hard Mm -hmm. the the new age person saying no God never made anybody's heart hard and who knows where it came from? (laughs) Like, but that's God anyway. The hard heart is the hard heart is God, And, and and. you can see why a lot of these false beliefs get created. Hey? From, from one set of false beliefs, everybody rebels and then they create a whole new set of false beliefs to yes. rebel against the old yeah. set of false beliefs. Yeah. And they are also untrue, unfortunately. And this is why divine truth challenges everybody because, because almost everybody is going to hear something from us that confronts their current belief system. I've noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just getting back to the specifics of your paragraph, you yeah. were talking about like us recognising that God didn't create us with mm. this evil part of us. Mm. But you, you said when ma- men grasped the meaning and thus explained of what these things really are, so which is what you've just explained, that actually this pain, this suffering, this evil comes as a result of us exercising these animal appetites out of harmony with law continually Mm. all the time Mm -hmm. so i love that in this paragraph you say once you understand that that's how it got there Mm -hmm. now you're going to more readily comprehend the way or means to remove it to to destroy this this issue and i see a lot of people just resisting how this mess got started Mm. in their own life in the whole world whatever Mm -hmm. nobody wants to go there because it's a bit scary like Mm. what are we going to have to face on the the road to knowing it and and i even see that in my i even think it's worse than that the majority of people don't want to accept 
that the reality of their own life is because of creations that have occurred inside of their own soul. Mm. They, they, they want to always blame someone else. Yes. <laughs> always. And, you know, we teach a lot about how in our childhood emotions were suppressed in us and so there's injuries within us. Mm. And then I see people go, right, it's all it's my, all mum my and dad's parents' fault. fault. No, and it's not. That's not what we're saying, actually. No, not at all. In, fact, in fact, we're saying something quite different mm -hmm. to that. We're saying that, sure, your parents created some of these appetites and so forth, but it's you using your will to have them satisfied that is causing your problem. Yes, yes, and this <laughs> that ultimately... It comes back to us and the way we use our will. Exactly. This is why God put us here to understand that we have a will and that it's powerful and creative. Yeah. And yes, yes, things entered us in a way that was painful or there has been pain in our life. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, here we know, we know now how to reverse that process. Yeah. And so I think it takes courage to look at how these things entered us yep. honestly but then to honestly say, ah, now that it's there, that gives me a good understanding of how to remove, remove it. it. Mm. And that's up to me. Mm. Yeah. And I always worry a lot about people who, who, you know, come to us and say, oh, but that was because my mum did this or that was because my dad did that. No, it's not, actually. It's because you're willing to continue to have your animal appetites exercised out of harmony with law that has caused these problems in you now. Yeah. Now, sure, the underlying appetite or desire came from something in your history, but your willingness to operate out of harmony with law is the cause of their existence mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And this is where people, uh, I feel, are very resistive. As soon as they hear the truth that mum and dad have, have created some desires and emotions within us that are painful through the exercise of their will out of harmony with love, as soon as they hear that, they just want to blame mum and dad for everything mm -hmm. and not understanding that there are plenty of people on this planet who are trying to exercise their will in harmony with love even though yeah. they have the damage from their childhood. Yeah. And, and this is something that all of us must start to embrace if we're truly going to change anything on this planet. We're going to have to embrace that process. Yeah. One of the other favourite uh, sort of blaming techniques or avoidance techniques that I've heard from people a lot is when when we deliver the gift of understanding how this stuff happened and how it entered you or how you chose to be unloving like to point out to a person actually right now that's unloving because mm. of this mm. uh, then uh, people say but I didn't know when I did it as if to say you haven't given me a gift <laughs> you know <laughs> when <laughs> if we were really sincere when we hear that we go Thank you. Mm. Now I know how to never do that again. Exactly. Now I know how to remedy this thing inside of myself. Yeah. But, but a lot, lot of people are just rebellious, like eh? Yeah. And <laughs> I, I would include myself in that yeah. camp. We go, but, 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 <laughs> yeah. we're always looking for some uh, other answer yeah. other than the truth generally. Yeah. I've said in the conclusion of this paragraph, the purity of his true being is always besmirched by the impurities of his own artificial being and always will be until he eliminates these impurities, which as to him and his fellow man are real persistent existences. Mm -hmm. So here I've introduced the concept of the, the artificial being compared to the real being, which is very similar to the concept I talk about now when I talk about the facade, facade self compared to your real self. Yeah. And, and what I'm saying to people, there's the, th the three selves, there's the true being God created, and then there's the... The, um, the, the true uh, the self, damaged. The, the damaged self, yeah. which is actually the artificial being. And then there is even the being that's in complete denial. And that being is the facade, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and so what I'm basically doing here in this message is trying to introduce to Paget the concept that the true being, while it was of God's creation, has been damaged by not just impurities of, of our parents, but impurities that come from our own making, mm -hmm. that our own creations exercised because of the, th the way in which we've exercised our will out of harmony with love. I, I just love as well the idea that, wow, God created me this beautiful character mm -hmm. and then some stuff happened and I used my will. It wasn't very loving. Yeah. And I actually created like an artificial being. Yeah. And the fact that... it. 
the joy that comes from letting go of the artificial being and yeah. knowing knowing that God created something good. God created something good and I don't have to be afraid about what I'm going to uncover. Mm. Just have to have the courage to let go of all this pain. Exactly. It's that's yeah. a it's like a huge relief. I feel like I've spent like 30 years be. trying to create something good because yeah. I had no faith in that. Yeah. yeah, it can be, but not always is a huge relief, eh? Because most people are so addicted to their facade artificial self that they believe that that is you know, like that that person that they have now created as a figment almost of their own imagination but it's part of their real self now that needs to be released they almost believe that's better than what god created and yeah. and that's where i see a lot of people really struggling because they don't they're not humble enough to see that what god creates is always better than what we can create <laughs> particularly better than what we can create when we exercise our will out of harmony with love the reality is we can create some beautiful changes to our own soul and personality if we exercise our will in harmony with love. But, but if we exercise our will out of harmony with love, we, our creations are never going to be very good and, in fact, can be quite disastrous to our own soul mm -hmm. as well as to the souls of others. And I feel that a lot of the times people are so afraid of God's creation for some reason. I don't really get that. Uh, but, but, and I feel a lot of it is mostly because it's they've become so addicted to what they imagine themselves to be. Yeah, and well, I think I fell into that category though. I feel that this newfound, oh, what a relief that I get to be what God created is quite a new feeling mm. for me. Mm. As I've expressed to you, and I think I've maybe expressed in other public seminars we've given, you know, I had a lot of fear of facing what was in me and then what is going to be left mm. underneath all this stuff. Mm. And I feel it was not only there's self-reliance in it, feeling that an arrogance. No, I know what's good and I'm going to be that. Mm. I'm going to create that. I'm going to be it. Mm. So there was very large lack of humility in me around feeling like I knew what was good and mm. I, I should and I will be it. Mm. But then I feel there's also these other ideas that we imbibe that incarnation of what our parents believe is good mm. and and so when I found and become, any part become of... become addicted to that Well, yeah, definition. and when I found any part of my personality that is God's personality, but my parents have injuries around that, my parents reject in some way, that was a big conflict for me. And often I think that I was feeling that my parents... And my parents' ideas, and my parents were the closest idea that I had to God growing up. Mm. You know... I was afraid of what is God's creation and it was somehow mixed up in what they thought was good and mm. what if I found out I wasn't like that and, mm. and there was not a lot of... And it is true that many of our uh, animal appetites exercised in an unlawful way are actually the result of our parents exercising their animal appetites in an unlawful yeah. manner when we were growing up and yeah. imposing those particular systems on us. Yeah. But, but at some point, we also have to take responsibility for the fact that we have imbibed that and also have then acted upon that, even though the world at large was reflecting to us most of the time that something was wrong with that definition. Yeah, sorry. I think I was trying to say this fear of the fear of what I'm going to find, yeah. you know, letting go of the artificial self, that was more related to the feeling that I had that my parents, because of their own injuries, re rejected my real self. See, and I would, so and I, whereas I would say it was more related to the fact that you wanted to please your parents' definition. Yes, it's sort of like yes. your parents can have a definition that's independent to yourself. It's only your desire to please that definition, which is actually the big driving factor, in your, was a big driving factor in your life, that caused you to act in the manner that you did Deny, in denial of some of your real self. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, uh, the way I feel about it is probably a little different in the sense that we often, we often blame other people for what their demands of us are when the reality is we often have a choice, even when they are demanding, we have a choice to do something loving or unloving and we go along with the unloving choice. Absolutely. And I feel that is what we've got to be careful of doing, and I feel that's what you've got to be careful of doing now, is that, is that in some way your statements are saying 
that, that you didn't have a choice then, but you did. Sorry, I wasn't talking about the exercise of my will. I was talking about the fear I had of uncovering my real self. I understand, but even that okay. is about the exercise of your will. All right. I understand what you were saying. Yeah, sure. But, but what, what I'm suggesting is the exercise of our will, why would we be afraid of anything that God had created? That's because we're exercising our will for, to, to be in agreement with what somebody else has created generally. Yes. And, and why would we be exercising our will in that direction? Only because either we don't think that God exists or we don't think that God is real or don't think God has a certain direction. And where did all that come from? Well, that come from us having a desire to exercise our will in the direction of getting the approval of family or friends or society or whatever other things we're addicted to. Yeah. So I feel even we've got to be so careful here drawing the line where the line needs to be. And the, where the line needs to be is we need to see that even though our parents, through their own unlawful exercise of their own will, have imposed certain things upon us, we need to see that it was also our, the use of our, our will, will to please them. Yes. Even when around us at the time we could see problems with pleasing them. Problems within ourselves in that we were suppressing ourselves problems with in terms of what they were creating their own lives towards other people. All sorts of problems are evident even to a child and yet we chose to do it for a reason. Yeah. And, and then as, our, as we grow up and we hit you know, our teenage years, we are now actively choosing it yeah. for a reason. Yeah. And it's to feed these, un, uh, these unlawful addictions and desires of our parents in many cases that we have actively chosen it. But eventually these things become a part of our own nature so much so that they become our own unlawful exercise of our own unlaw of our own will. Yeah. So really, that's a big furphy. I, the dread that I had of uncovering my true self was really, or is really, because I'm still working through that, is really about my dread of losing my parents' approval. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And we need and, to see I, it for what it is. Yes. And. Uh, I, and I'm relating those feelings to God also. Because in some ways, a lot of people are dreading their true self when if they thought logically and with faith, they would never dread their true self because God created their true self. So therefore, their true self must always be better. Well, this is the thing that this is what started our mm -hmm. segue, yeah. um, was that I always dreaded it. And now I have some faith that in the end, I'm going to be good. Exactly. Uh, but I still have... Now I feel the dread of losing my parents' approval for being for being that God's person creation. that God of yes. God's creation, which yeah. will be very different to what the parents imagine would be the ideal person. Yes, and yes. and this is where we've got to see that again the parents' unlawful exercise of their own will imposed upon the child causes the child to honour the parents' definition above God's, right? And as a problem, so in other words, the parents have become God, right? And, and then, but then the child still has a choice as it grows up, and particularly when it becomes an adult, it still has a choice to go along with the exercise of its will in that direction. Yes, but which it is has, painful, by the way. And, and you do feel it's pain. <laughs> yes. Often the child, by the time they're a teenager, the reason why we call the teenage years the hard years when we're parenting many times is because yeah. the child's in rebellion to our unlawful uh, the parents' unlawful exercise, exercise of, their will. of their will. And the child can, is sensitive to that in many cases. And, and yet we still continue to do it. Mm. And that is our choice. And we've got to see that we are making choices. And, and this is what I was trying to illustrate in this, in this passage, is that we can't blame everything on everybody else. Mm. We've got to at some point see that we have made choices. And, and even the, the reality is our parents can be terrible people and we can still make loving choices. Absolutely. So we've got yeah. to be very careful where we draw this line yes. of what is the underlying reason of why yes. we do things, even why we try to seek their approval. Absolutely, mm. absolutely, which is fear, it's, which is allowing an animal appetite to overcome our spiritual nature. Spot on, exactly, yeah. exactly that. It's yeah. the same problem right from the beginning. Yes. Allowing yes. an animal appetite to overcome a spiritual nature. But you know, it's so confronting. For someone who's been addicted to approval, right. it's really confronting to recognize because you've been spending your whole life trying to be a good girl, exactly. like, and then to then to recognize that actually, no, there's this huge animal appetite of fear that's actually dark that has been governing my life. 
this is not a good thing that I've been doing. <laughs> that is, it's very confronting. And this is why it's tempting to say, it's all them. It's all because they want me to do it. Yes. It's all because yes. they pushed me to do it. They made me do it. And fear always says messages like that, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. Whenever people use fear to justify their actions, they're always saying, but it was the it was situation. Some, something else. They made me. I had no choice. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And then none of that is true. Yeah. None of that is true. Yeah. And particularly when we become adult, it's not true. So we need to bear that in mind. Um, I've, I've then said the will, however, is the great force that must be used in the destruction of these excrescences. And as this willpower in man is free and untrammeled in its operations follows, and that in its operations follows the suggestions and desires of the appetites, both animal and spiritual, of man, it therefore becomes apparent that these appetites and desires must first be controlled and directed in that direction that will cause the will to be exercised in such a manner as to lead the thoughts and deeds towards the realisation of the desires and appetites in harmony with God's laws. Whew, another long sentence <laughs> uh, um, as well, which I'll try to um, get across to, to people. What, what I was saying here, firstly, let's look at this, uh, this underlying principle. The will is the great force. Mm -hmm. It's not the appetites or the unlawful exercise. Or, and none of those things have real power compared to your will. Mm -hmm. It's your will that has the power. I love this truth. Right? It's yeah. really it's worth really it in my life right? this last six months. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel this is where many people in Christian faith uh, err, err because they believe that the heart of man is bad from his youth up, as, yeah. a, quote, as a direct quote from the Bible there. Yeah. And, and the problem with believing these particular things, that, that we are flawed creations of God, is that firstly, it's blasphemous towards God because yeah. God never creates a flawed creation. But secondly, it denies the use of our will in mm -hmm. directions that, that are unloving. It, it actually... It says, well, that's what we're going to do. That's our nature. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and we only need to be forgiven for our bad nature. Yeah. God never created our bad nature, as mm -hmm. we call it. And the reality is we don't have a bad nature either. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the way God created us is with a pure, loving nature. We are the ones who, through the unlawful exercise of our will, have created any of the badness that exists or evil exists within us, and we are therefore directly responsible for its removal. Mm -hmm. God it cannot remove anything from our soul that we are unwilling to remove. Yes, right? because so that's will. That's our will. Yeah. That's our will being exercised. And, but also here you say that the will in its operations follows the su suggestions and, and desires of the appetites. So this, exactly. you've already made the distinction in this message that your appetites are separate from your mind yes. and, and they're emotional. So it's not your mind that you're going to have to change. No. no. So you're saying that your will is largely governed in its operations uh, by these appetites, both animal and spiritual. Well, what I was saying is, in fact, if you look at, if you look and, and imply what I've said above into this paragraph, you'll mm -hmm. see that what I was trying to get across to Paget, and he didn't write it at that moment, was it's to do with the emotional part of man, that the, which is the seat of his desires and suggestions that cause him to act, use his will in a certain direction. Now, what we need to use is our will to refuse to follow these directions. And we also need to remove these suggestions, which come from the emotional part of our nature, not from our mind. Mm -hmm. We need to remove these suggestions from our emotional part of our nature. To do that, we're going to have to feel some emotions. It's very obvious we're going to have to feel some emotions. Well, it's very obvious because <laughs> even earlier in the message, you've said you have to know what created it, yep. these emotional appetites, and then we're going to know how to reverse it. That's it, it. That's, it's in the same thing in reverse order. And it's the suppression of these emotions, the, the suppression of the experience of these emotions that create the problem. So as you correctly pointed out earlier, the expression of these emotions in a, in a manner in harmony with love, yes. using our will in yes. harmony with love, that is going to free us of these animal appetites exercised out of harmony with love. It doesn't mean that we won't have animal appetites because the reality is we, there are many appetites inside of our soul, inside of our bodies, that are completely in harmony with love. 
Even our appetite for eating is completely in harmony with love <laughs> yes. under some circumstances, <laughs> but not under all circumstances. If we become a glutton, it's now out of harmony with love. Yeah. Right. If we eat the wrong foods that destroy our body, we are now out of harmony with love. So with any single appetite, even a physical one that we have, we can exercise it either in or out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand, as I'm saying here, that it's the desires and emotions that exist within us that cause us to choose They, such they create actions. our will. They, they, they influence call, our will. They influence our will yep. greatly. And, yep. and we're going to have, in this initial transformation of using our will in this one direction that's negative into using it in a positive direction, we are going to have a great big fight with ourselves. Because on one hand, we've got our will saying, no, don't do that, go and do that, go and do that, do that thing you've always done, yep. or that thing that's, that's negative that's creating your pain and suffering. And on the other hand, you're saying, no, no, I don't want that pain and suffering anymore. I want something better than that. I want to use my will in this direction. And of course, there is going to be an internal tug, mm -hmm. an emotional process that's going to need to uh, occur within us until the use of your will in harmony with love asserts itself. And that is the birthplace of integrity. Exactly. <laughs> when we say, no, I'm going to use my will in harmony with love, in harmony Every with the time. law that I know, yep. and I'm not going to succumb to... It doesn't mean those desires don't exist. Exactly. But I'm going to... And that's when true emotional healing has its chance, I yes. feel. Yes. Because while we're just going, yeah, yeah, I've got to feel about this, but I'm still going to keep doing it because really it's just oh, too scary or painful yeah. or whatever otherwise... We're not healing anything. Not you know, at all. We're, we're like just a, crying about... We're like a smoker yeah. who's saying, I want to give up. <sighs> this will be my last one. And then he puts that one out, you know, and then yeah. there goes another one. Oh, that was my last one. <laughs> you know, and yeah. he's not being true to himself. He's not being real. The reality is the animal appetite is still leading his nature. Yeah. And until something changes, until he honours that he's doing damage to his body, until he honours the truth, until he honours integrity, until he actually uses his will in a different direction, he won't give up. No. He won't give up smoking. No. No matter what happens, no. he won't. And even, and this is where really it, the animal appetites are involved and the, the, the spirit, harnessing the spiritual animal appetites are so powerful, isn't it? Because as we see, a lot of people use their mind and say, that's it, I'm stopping smoking. And they, and perhaps they even see it's not good for me, it's not loving to mm. my family or it's mm. a waste of money, whatever. Mm. They say, no, I'm stopping. But if they neglect dealing with the animal appetites, which for a lot of people is fear and a, a feeling very bad about themselves and a desire to avoid those things. A deep lack of love for themselves, uh, actually. Yeah, mm. feeling like... I used to used to smoke, and I, I, as I said to you the other day, it was like indulgent self hatred. Yeah. I can f remember the emotion I had as yeah. I did it, and yeah. it was like, uh, yeah, self indulgent hatred of you know of myself. Yeah. Um, but unless we address those emotions, then we're going to go back to smoking. Definitely. And we so we can use our will and say no, no, no. I'm going to honour the law in this situation. Mm -hmm. But if I neglect actually healing those animals... The emotions. The emotions. The emotions are, the are, are, are not a part of our true nature, but they are in us now. The part of my artificial being, yeah. the, the pain, yeah. then it's never going to work. No. Which is why the Christian scientists died when they said it's just my mind creating this illness. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and, and it's very important for people to understand those particular principles, I feel, because... Because if, if, we, if we think we can use our mind to get out of things, that's not going to be the solution. Mm -hmm. If we can think we can use our mind to ignore it, that's not going to be the solution. If we think we can use our mind to uh, modify our behaviour and be able to do that for the rest of it, that's not going to be the solution either. Mm -hmm. The only real solution is going to be finding these emotional desires and passions within our soul that are driving our will in a negative direction and an unloving direction that cause us to make decisions in an unloving direction, it's only by removing them will our nature change. Yes. Now, we could choose to remove them ourselves or we can choose to allow God to help us remove them. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? But either way, they're going to have to be removed yes. in order for our nature to change. Yes. Right? And, and as to choosing which one we choose, well, most of us don't allow God to do it. 
and we don't want to do it ourselves. <laughs> and so we continue doing <laughs> yeah. whatever we do. And we berate ourselves periodically for doing what we do. Yeah. And, and this and is why self-flagellation and all sorts of other religious practices have, have begun in order, you know, people feel so guilty. No, they have their knowledge, their mind is saying, no, your will is being used in an unloving direction now. And their heart's going, no, no, I still want to do it. I still want to do it. And then they feel like, oh, half the planet wants to blame God. So they've created doctrines which say that God is to blame. God created us bad and we're, yeah. we're, the heart of bad, man is bad from, from the time he's born onwards. And, and that, that are, that's all an excuse to get away from the fact that we can change. And, and then the other half say, oh, no, no, we're all good, actually, and it's all just a figment of imagination, <laughs> which is also a lie. <laughs> and avoiding having to change. <laughs> and avoiding having to change. Yes. And, and, and this is what I see as a problem. There's so many religious practices on this planet that are all been, have all been created to help large groups of people avoid the truth about what their own creations have, have done in their life and yeah. to the lives of others. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Right. You want to, yeah. And so let's uh, continue because it's very important yes. that we understand some of the rest of the part of this mm -hmm. because I haven't finished making all of my <laughs> points yet with Fadget. <laughs> so I've said, as sin and evil are not the creatures of the spiritual desires but wholly of the animal and then to eradicate from man's being these things of evil and sin, the efforts of man must be directed towards the supplanting of the unlawful and inharmonious animal desires and appetites by appetites and desires arising from the same source that is in harmony with the laws, creating this very source. Now, a lot of people read that and go, that doesn't make much sense either, but it is very clear, yes. I feel. Yes. <laughs> it's just a very long sentence. It's just a very long sentence again. <laughs> what I'm basically saying here is that we need to understand that even though we may have what we're classifying here as animal, and, and probably, you know, I was using terminology here that Paget understood, you know, from 100 years ago. And it must be said that many animals have, in their core nature, much more harmonious emotion or much more harmonious sort of nature uh, towards God's laws and, and everything than humans do. Yeah. So, so it's probably a bad thing to call it animal <laughs> appetites because a lot of times it's much more worse than animal appetites in many yep. cases, right? But, but what we want to get across here is that if we understand that these emotional desires and appetites that are within us that are being exercised in an unloving direction, um, these are not a core part of our animal nature. The reality is our animal nature can be completely in harmony mm -hmm. with love and truth, right? Just as every other part of us can be completely in harmony with love and truth. And we need to understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, this, I constantly get emails from people uh, saying that they feel that it's impossible for them to do certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, often we get emails from men saying, it's impossible for me to have one woman in my life from a sexual perspective. Well, I suggest to them, no, it's not impossible. It's just that you don't desire to use that desire for sex in harmony with the true nature that God created it to be. Yeah. That, that, that's all it is. And the irony is when that happens, it's far more fulfilling. God created it that way. Exactly. To be, when we use our animal desires, if you'd like to call and, them that. And they have emotions in them as to why they want to have sex with lots of different women. And those emotions need to be eradicated before they're going to stop. Mm -hmm. And they can talk to us about, oh, I've tried to stop and it doesn't work. No, of course it doesn't work because you haven't released the actual in underlying emotional reason why you've chosen to do such things. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what I'm trying to get across to people, that there, there are... God has created this ability for us to have all of our appetites and all of our emotions, all of this core part of our soul to be completely in harmony with love, completely in harmony with every one of God's laws. Mm. God's created us with that potential. God also created us with the potential by giving us free will that we could choose to exercise it completely out of harmony with love and law and as a result have all of these animal appetites dictating our full nature right the way through and through to having a murderous nature and even worse in many cases like mass murdering nature mm -hmm. as many people in history have had 
So we, we, we have the ability to choose. Mm. And I feel that people don't have any understanding about their ability to choose. They, they keep wanting to blame things which is actually an avoidance of their own responsibility to choose. Yes. yes. And, that, and that's what something I feel is quite bad in terms of the way people, um, they, they basically are justifying their unloving choices, saying that we are incapable of making a better choice. Mm -hmm. And that is not true at all. Yeah, I like in this paragraph as well that you say it's about... Um, supplanting the unlawful and inharmonious desires by, by more harmonious um, animal desires and appetites. So exactly. it's, you know, it's not just making the choice not to do something. It's, re it's actually it's growing a desire. Something. Yeah, it's growing a desire for something new and different. Mm. And I feel that's one of the really powerful desires of our soul is to demonstrate to people that actually... You can. It is possible to have something. Uh, use your desires in this new and different way, and it to be very beautiful. Yes. Um, yeah. But because a lot of people, I suppose, look around and say, "Well, I don't know what the example of that is. What does it look like when I use these desires in harmony with love?" Mm. And they use that as an excuse, which is not a good excuse. No, none of these Because there is a lot. Things. There's a lot of feedback, and there's a lot of guidance available. God's designed it that way. Should mm. we desire to do something, to grow a desire for more pure uses of our animal appetites? Yes. Yeah. I, I just feel God's given us so much feedback. And, and it's only our denial of the feedback system that causes us to say we're not getting educated. Mm -hmm. You know, the reality <laughs> is... We're it, in the biggest university. Exactly. And, and the reality is God's educational system is far more powerful than any other educational system. If we choose to acknowledge the reality of our own creations, we will look at the world today and we go, yeah, something is major wrong here mm -hmm. and something's got to be major wrong with me because I'm, <laughs> I'm in this world living yeah. in it and a part of the creation of yeah. it. So, so there's got to be some things wrong with me that I've got to address. Yes. And, 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 and I've got to do it. If I don't do it, then I'm just aiding the creation of these things. And, uh, you know, I see just so many people not honouring that still. You know, yeah. so many people who've been listening to us for five years not honouring that yeah. or longer not honouring that still. Yeah. And, uh, and I'd really love to see people see, uh, you know, change with the way their attitude with regard to the use of their will. And, and also this idea of choosing to desire something different rather mm. than being very... Um, Justifying the, the bad, really. Justifying the bad or berating yourself for the bad or just trying to suppress. It's funny. Suppress we, the bad, we're deny it. About, yeah, not suppressing and, yeah. you know, being more honest. And yet I see people acknowledge things about themselves and then try to suppress it and change it without actually growing a desire for a new type of life and a yeah. new type of experience. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's keep going. It says, man was created by God with animal appetites, just as he was created with spiritual aspirations. And the one is just as harmonious with the laws of his creation as the other. And the loss of the spiritual aspiration or the perversion of the animal appetites similarly causes man to become out of harmony with these laws. Say, you say. Yeah, <laughs> no, I just think that that's really powerful and I was recalling that you had an email from a professional athlete not long ago mm. um, and you were talking to him about he was having a lot of um, questioning about sports mm. uh, you know what what does this mean this com competitive nature that's in sports you know sh does does my life have meaning or is there a purpose to this and you wrote back to him very eloquently and talked about how you can bring those desires into harmony with love and actually demonstrate through your physical prowess and through your relationship with God mm. just what is possible when you bring those and just appetites. what the physical body is possible of doing. Yes, yeah. yeah. If you bring them in harmony with how God created them to be expressed. Mm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So that man, in order to become free from these foreign parts of his being, must strive not by a denial of their reality, but by the effort to supplant them, to recreate, as it were, in himself the animal appetites that are consistent and in harmony with those which were his when he was made the perfect man. In other words, to destroy the beings of his own creation and possess only those of the creation of God. 
Mm. Yeah. And I think that's pretty obvious what we're trying to say now. Like we're trying to talk about how these emotions and feelings that are inside of us that are driving us in this negative direction, they will have to be removed and supplanted by something else if we're ever going to get back to being the creation that God created us to be. Yeah. Yeah, and I like how you've used this animal appetites, which is a terminology that Padgett in his time was very familiar with in religious circles and things of mm. being dark and terrible. Mm. And you've sort of relayed this message to him around the animal appetites and helping him to... And now by almost the end of the message, you're, you're bringing this new truth to him, which is actually they're not bad. Mm. You just need to bring them in harmony with how God created them. Exactly, Yeah. exactly. Of course, in this effort, he will have to use his mind, mortal or otherwise. By the way, we have an otherwise brain, mind, <laughs> our spirit body's brain. But in addition, he will also have to exercise the faculties of his emotional and affectional nature, which are not of the mind, but of the soul. And, and like, this is the crux of what I'm trying to say in the message, basically, is that the emotional and affectional nature... In other words, what I'm saying is all of our emotions and passions and our affectional nature, the, the things we love, mm -hmm. the things we love have to be exercised through the soul. They can't be exercised through the mind. And in fact, there are so many people that we're hearing of lately saying how love is not an emotion. I mean, we've read Christian things that say love is not an emotion. I've read pageant message people commenting on it saying love is not a... No, love is an emotion. It is part of the affectional nature of our soul. Yeah. And these are the things that are needed in order for us to be able to develop. And these are the things that we have to use, have an effort in using, so therefore we have to develop them. If we're ever going to supplant these negative, unlawful exercise of these emotions and affection of nature that's unlawful into being in harmony with God's laws. Yes. So the mere negation of belief will not be sufficient but desires and cravings for these things which engender sin must be supplanted by desires and craving for those things which are in harmony with his creation. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, uh, I feel like, what we, we all need to understand. Now, how we can supplant them depends upon what path we choose. Mm -hmm. Now, if a person doesn't believe in God, then I suggest they're probably not going to want to involve God in the process of supplanting them. And so, therefore, they're going to have to work on supplanting them within themselves mm -hmm. and the only way they can do that is by becoming more loving in their affectional nature and understanding the truth about their emotions and how their emotions affect their life. So emotional processing work is going to be essential whether we have God or not. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. Whether yeah. we have God or not, we're going to need to go through that process. Now, if we engage God in the process, which is a different discussion, engaging divine love in the process, receiving divine love in the soul, then this transformation can occur much more quickly and with much more success. But it is always going to involve our emotional always nature. Always going to involve our emotional yeah. nature. Yeah, and also this idea that, like you're saying, the affectional nature, which is the things that we love, which is very emotional. Mm. But in some of the examples we've given during our discussion today is we're talking about when we love fear, when we love power. when we And so we're going to supplant those things with a love of peace, with a love of you know, humanity with the love of God, with the love of ourselves. Mm. And this is, this is a very important understanding of what affectional nature means, I think. Yes, you know. yeah, very much so. Yeah. So I repeat, the teachings that sin and error and disease are not real and are no part of man's being as he now exists and lives is erroneous and when not understood, harmful and not sufficient to bring about the regeneration of man. In one sense, it is true that sin and error and disease are not real but that means that so far as God's creation of man is concerned, they have no existence. For he created only that which was good and in harmony with his perfect laws. But as man is a creator as well as a creature, and as these things are the creatures of man alone, then so far as being of man is involved, they have a reality which will persist until their creator, man, has destroyed them. I am pleased that you gave me the opportunity to write today and I'm also glad to find you in good condition, your brother and, and friend and brother Jesus. So what we were trying to uh, discuss through this message was 
giving people a clearer understanding of some of these Paget messages is going to help them a lot in terms of determining how they're going to proceed mm -hmm. with this growth of the soul. Because without understanding that it's this emotional, affectional, desire-based part of the soul, which is not of your mind, that needs to be changed or transformed, they're not going to truly understand how God's love even works. Because how God's love works is not upon the mind, but rather also upon this affectional nature of the soul, this, you know, the emotions and, the, and appetites of the soul. And so we, if we're going to improve the humanity at any level, whether we do it with God or without, if we do it without God, we are going to have to choose to supplant these emotional passions and desires that are exercised out of harmony with love with ones that are, ex inside, that are exercised in harmony with love. Mm -hmm. And how we do that with, by ourselves is quite difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, it's quite difficult. I've observed many millions of people were doing it over <laughs> thousands of years. And I've, seen, I've found that many of them find it very difficult <laughs> and, uh, and some almost impossible. When you engage God in the process, obviously it simplifies the matter to a degree. But if you don't understand how your soul works and you don't understand the importance of these emotions and how they're dictating your life, then you are still going to struggle mm -hmm. because you won't allow God to change them. And this is something that we need to discuss in a future in a future discussion of future messages. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if you have any closing no, comments to that. Just, so um, I feel it's a really um, pivotal message, really, mm. that um, that holds a lot of truth. And yeah. Yeah. The irony was for me when I was talking about it with Paget was that it was sort of an incidental message. And what we, what we had, by the time of 1916 and 1917, which was when these messages were written, by the time of then Paget was starting to go through his own doubts and disbelief of what we were saying to him, and we found at times it was quite difficult to give him messages which we wanted to give him. And a lot of the messages we wanted to give him were about the emotional part of man, about how the, this emotional soul-based part of man was very different to the mind and, and how, you know, the two, the, it influenced many of their decisions. And we found it almost impossible in most cases to give him messages of this nature uh, until he was reading a book of a certain kind or, or yes. some kind of material. So what we would do is we would try to motivate him to go and read the book yeah. And that would open him up to a certain uh, way of thinking. And then when he had that way of thinking, he would be tempted to start writing. And then when he started writing, we could have more of a positive effect on, on the writing and, and, and he would be in quite good condition to receive a message. And that's what happened in this case, in this message. Yeah. Mm. Um, I feel that our spirit friends are so loving. You know, our celestial friends have so much love for us in that they often are very opportunistic. Um, <laughs> whenever they find our soul open, mm -hmm. they, they're there ready with a lot of love and truth. Yeah, yeah. And it's very interesting reading the messages chronologically because you can see that in the year or so following um, Helen's death, Paget was so open mm. because he was grieving mm. and so his heart was open and there was a lot of emotion flowing and so mm. there was a lot of messages given to him in that time. And, yeah. um, and yet by the time he reached to 1917, it was, uh, he was already really quite shutting down again quite strongly and, and unfortunately it was difficult for us. We were constantly trying to remind him, get in condition, get in condition. Yeah. But, but, and we'd given him lots of messages like this to tell him what we meant by get in condition. Yeah. But because those messages, aside from a few of them like this, never found themselves into the actual pageant messages themselves, most readers are a bit confused. Why are they saying get in condition, get in condition okay. again? Like he wants to hear the message, he wants to get the message, but we're not being able to deliver it. Mm. And the reason why is because he wasn't understanding this ba these basic principles about how the soul operates. And look, I think as a medium myself, who, who's, who has regularly and not so much lately done a lot of mediumship, it's easy to get almost arrogant about your own messages in that they're not your messages, but the messages you receive in that you, you receive a message. It might be quite emotional at the time and you think you understand it and you put it down and go away. And invariably, when I come back to old messages and I reread them, I think, how did I miss that big thing that they were telling me, you know, because yeah. 
uh, my soul was open to a certain amount and willing to connect to certain things they were saying to me, I thought I got the message. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, often there's a lot more. As many people comment to us as they're watching these pageant message discussions that we're having of like, wow, I would never have got all of that from it. And yet we're just reading the words and discussing them. Exactly. Uh, there's, there's often a lot more that our spirit friends are trying to tell us. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I feel people need to appreciate that in the Paget messages there there was a shortage of information uh, from our perspective mm. because uh, because obviously there was a neglect of certain types of information because of his condition, and uh, and while it was great that we could uh, transmit a lot of these kind of messages to him, we would have loved to have transmitted far more to him to show him how whether whether we're on the natural love path on you know doing it by ourselves or we're doing it with god how it is that we could focus on addressing these emotions and par the parts of our soul that we needed to release in order to progress mm. and and so we hope that today myself and mary hope that today uh, that you you've been able to understand this particular message more but not only understand this message more but understand a bit of the dynamics about how paget was channeling and what kind of material Paget was often resistive to channeling? Because this kind of material he was often resistive to channeling when we started talking about the emotions and effect, affections of, the, of man. And, and as a result, there are some distortions of the truth in the Paget messages. But, but the beauty is that we can now go through, myself and Mary, go through our own messages to Paget and explain to you what we were meaning and also some of the background and some of the things that were affecting his ability to transmit such messages and put them from pen to paper. But we'd like to thank you for your time again today, listening to us about that yeah. message. And we'll, uh, we're going to continue with our discussion with the pageant messages because we feel there are so many messages that are really important for most people to understand. Yeah. So bye for now. And thanks for Igor behind that camera and Lena behind, behind that, one. that camera over there for our recording today. <laughs>